Okay, welcome back to the Open Programming Miniconf. This is the last hour of scheduled talks for this year. Um, once again, we have uh, lightning talk sign-ups on the wiki. We've got about six filled now. Uh, if you can get four or so more in, it would be awesome. That way we can fill out the whole hour and I'll be very happy indeed. Um, right, so our next presenter, who is presenting his second talk of the day, uh, was once described by Jeff War as who? <laughs> Actually true. <laughs> there is Twitter evidence. Anyway, he's going to be talking about um, new things in CSS. Please make Adam welcome. Thank you very much. Um, this is going to be a slightly different sort of a talk for a programming heavy mini conf. Um, you know, we've had some interesting embedded stuff. We've had some, you know, maths. We've had some segmentation faults, mostly from Joel. Um, <laughs> What we haven't really had is the sorts of things that you can do if you study the humanities and social sciences. If you study a BA at the University of Ballarat, you will learn to succeed. So I'm going to take it down a notch. We're going to go a little bit softer and lighter, and we're going to talk about some style, because I'm all about the style. So there are a lot of interesting new things in CSS3, and God knows I'm not going to try and cover them all in 20 minutes because I'd like to have a voice left at the end of it. Um, but I'm going to touch on a few things that I think can improve your life, particularly if you're working in collaboration in a design sort of environment, um, or even if you're coming up with your own designs. Now, in the past, most of the things I'm talking about are things you can already do with JavaScript or by slicing and dicing in Photoshop properly or with myriad other techniques, i.e. filters in some cases. But we've now got these nice new standard compliant CSS3 modules that are starting to be implemented pretty widely across the board. We're getting a lot of stuff in WebKit, which is driving this. We're getting a lot of stuff in Firefox. Even Internet Explorer is coming along for the ride occasionally. And this is actually a good thing because it means that there are actually some practical reasons to, for the first time in about 10 years, to be using some new CSS techniques. Really, I think one of the biggies is actually the top one. A lot of these new features actually get hardware acceleration. Um, for example, on Android devices, a lot of the new things like gradient backgrounds are suddenly hardware accelerated. It's the same on iOS. Um, animations can be done actually in faster C code rather than in JavaScript, as good as JavaScript engines are getting. So better performance is, I think, a big win. You also get forward compatibility because people are generally implementing something that's close to the standard with one major exception I'm going to touch on shortly. And you also get quicker development because you can prototype and change things much faster. The less practical reason to do it is because people who look at your source will just go, oh, that's hot. <laughs> Which sounds like a really, really dumb reason, but if you ever actually want to work for a design agency, it's amazing how often they look at your portfolio and then raise in interviews that they actually like the way you implemented something. So Rule of Cool actually is somewhat practical. One of the things I think most people have played with is the new gradient support. Why would you use it? You get hardware acceleration, you don't have image size limits, um, which on iOS you can hit really easily, because I think it's three megapixels from memory, um, is the maximum size of a background image. Um, and you don't get weird scrolling effects. Um, people who have Android phones, if you noticed how images sort of posterize as you scroll, because they go down to a low color depth, don't get that. It's very nice. OK, why wouldn't you use CSS gradients? Well. Mostly because the syntax ends up looking something like this. I've actually omitted the IE filter version of this um, and a solid background colour. The thing that I personally dislike the most about this block, and there are many things I dislike about this block, is the two WebKit gradients because, well, in fairness to WebKit, they kind of paid the price there for being the first implementer because they implemented a syntax that um, nobody else implemented, the standards committee didn't like, and to be fair, is actually one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in CSS. And believe me, we're going to see some ugly things later, so that's saying something. But the, standard com the W3C version, which most of them now implement just as prefixed versions, is actually fairly sensible. It, there are a few terms there. And it basically breaks down, you've got an origin or an angle, and then you've just got colour stops. And you put the percentage they are along the way, and it works. So I think there are good reasons to use gradients. I realise I'm probably preaching to the converted here. It, you know, they've been around for a while, but as a refresher, they're there, they're cool, use them. 
In terms of actually generating that gigantic block that we had back there, I would just cheat and use a, an online gradient editor. Most of these CSS3 features now actually have, particularly the things which have lots and lots of vendor prefixes, actually have generators out there on the internet. Um, I've linked to a couple as I've gone along. I think it's probably worthwhile using them where you can because you don't really want to write that by hand. Or I don't anyway. Your mileage may vary. Another thing that's been added is transforms. Again, this is something that we've had a lot of tech demos of over the last couple of years, but I haven't seen much in the wild. Fundamentally, a transform is just one rule. Transform some sort of function and whatever parameters that function takes. Now, of course, in practice, <laughs> does anybody speak Vietnamese? <laughs> Also, can, I, can, does any, can anybody actually explain why this bar has come up halfway through viewing a single index file? I, I, <laughs> okay, where were we? Okay, so again, there are vendor prefixes for each of the vendors who have implemented this. Nobody actually implements the standard version just yet. Um, <laughs> Most of the, pretty much everything I'm going to talk about from here till the end is in this category. They've all got vendor prefixes. The nice thing is that unlike gradients, everybody actually figured out what they were going to implement before they did it this time, um, which means that we generally only have one actual canonical syntax. So in this case, this is how you would have a 33 degree rotation. I think you can also actually, and I haven't got this anywhere in the slides, but I think you can actually use a little Unicode degree sign too, if you like your CSS files to be nice. The 2D transform functions you get are the basics. Rotate, scale, skew, translate, and a transformation matrix. And there are various single dimensional versions of these that I'm not even going to bother demonstrating. You can look up the documentation on your own time, or right now if you're getting bored. So these work pretty much as you'd expect. So you can rotate some content. And I mean, this is regular text, so you can select it or do whatever you want to do with it. Scrolls normally. Um, the one thing I'm just going to draw your attention to, because I'm going to come back to this, is, and it's not so obvious on this, but just sort of watch the anti-aliasing as, as I go along. There's going to be a really obvious point where you're going to see what I'm getting at. You can scale, and you can scale differently in different dimensions. You can skew. You can translate, which is kind of, I'm sure there's a good reason for it. Um, <laughs> You can apply a transformation matrix. I was originally actually going to put you know, the actual notation up there and then ran around looking for whiteboard markers during the break instead. Um, and you can also translate and rotate. Now, OK, it hasn't really come up on the projector, but one of the things that's kind of obvious on my screen is that the anti-aliasing on this is actually different to regular text and also when it was rotated by 33 degrees. And I don't mean just because you know, it's a different angle, but the way it's actually being done is much thinner. So unless you're actually showing text from left to right, or right to left as the case may be, depending on language, you do get weird rendering behavior at times. It's like font family, or sorry, like font face for people who've played with that. Different browsers do different things in terms of sub, whether you've got subpixel rendering, whether you don't, whether you've got anti-aliasing, whether you don't. So it's another case of you've got to make sure you test on as many browsers and platforms as you can, because you may find that it's completely unreadable in some cases. Like the bottom line. Sorry? Like the bottom line there? Like the bottom line. <laughs> well, in fairness, that was my problem. <laughs> um, you also have some 3D transform functions. As those of you who were paying attention earlier will have noticed, I prefixed the earlier slide with 2D. These work pretty much the same way. You get a translate, scale, rotate, and a perspective transform. I've only actually done one example here because they're kind of obvious. But um, as you can see here, this is actually, it looks like it's being skewed, but this is actually just a 3D rotation. It's just leaning forward a bit as well. So, and again, this is just regular text. You know, it's, it's rotated, well, it technically it's rotated that way and it's leaning forward. And now I've got to click back out of the iframe. But you also get the ability to make things move around and fade and do things in an imperative way without actually having to go to JavaScript. And I think this is actually the most useful thing from the point of view of prototyping websites. And I'm going to come back to that later. CSS transitions are simply a way of defining what properties will transition and how between states. 
What do I mean by states? Well, states are just the same element with a pseudo selector like hover or a, a class applied or something like that. So for example, in this case, we've got a blue div over there. We've defined that the background will transition over the course of a second. You can define which timing function and therefore curve it uses and there's also a transition delay. I mean, conceptually, none of this is all that difficult if you've ever looked at, say, jQuery's animate method. You know, it's, it's the same thing. It's just, instead of writing it in JavaScript, you're just defining it in your style because it's a style-related thing. So on hover, we'll get it to go to red. So if I mouse over this, then nothing will happen. There we go. It does actually fade to red. <laughs> Similarly, we have, uh, oh, there's also a short version of the transition, of the transition property. So you can take all of that stuff there, property, duration, timing, function, and you can combine it into one, just the same as you can do with backgrounds and things like that, which is really useful. And this should, yeah, there we go. Um, you can also, as I said, state classes also count towards states. So this is one of the very few instances of actual code in this talk. I realise this is somewhat controversial for the Open Programming Miniconf. Um, but again, all we're doing here is when we click on this, we'll apply the on class, which will do the same thing. Okay, so now a digression. Now, in practice, those of you who have worked in, say, design agencies or for companies where you've been given a design by a designer, whether outsourced or internal, a lot of the time you end up with something really depressing, which is called a Photoshop file. Um, the reason why it's depressing, of course, is because you always end up with something that just has a bunch of static elements. Now, this is a cut down version of something I got last month. So this was a menu. And so there were four vertically arrayed elements. There was a bit of background, it doesn't really matter. So I got this, this was in a layer. Um, there was obviously some text on these. But apparently the client also wanted a submenu. So on another layer, which was not visible by default and I had to go hunting for, there was what the hover state of this was meant to look like. So our designer actually has seen a website before and was fairly cluey. A lot of them aren't. So that actually looked like this, where you had this top element here extended out wider. That's not just shoddy drawing, that's, that's actually what it looked like. Um, you had the other elements below, which should have been in line if I was capable of drawing. And then you had a submenu off this, like so, off the right hand side with more elements in there. That was the entirety of what I got. And when I went and asked the designer um, how she actually thought we were going to get from that to that, um, I pretty much got laughed out of her desk. Um, she said something about coming back with chocolate. <laughs> so, obviously, being the um, conscientious web developer I am, I went away and implemented it. Um, it was a little bit prettier than this in practice. But I'm just showing you the HTML that I use there. So it's reasonably semantic. I haven't even bothered putting any classes or IDs on. It's just, it is what it is. Obviously, it had links in it if it was a real, real nav. But just for simplicity, I've dropped those out. And with the styling I've applied, that looks like this. Now, I've got no events on this at the moment, so it just, it is what it is. It's just static. Um, oh, and for the record, all of these demos are, I mean, this is just a live web page, so the slide URL will be up at the end. You can pull these apart later if you want to. Um, that, there are no tricks. I'm not hiding anything behind the mirror. Curtain. Fail. <laughs> Okay, so we'll start with a basic hover. We've all, we've all done this before. So all this hover does is it extends out the width of the item when you mouse over it and it displays a submenu if it's got one on hover. So I don't know why this isn't actually working properly. This is kind of unusual. Okay. Reload frame. There we go. Okay, so you can see there we've got a submenu on the first item, so that appears out there, and then the others just extend out because they don't have submenus. Okay, that's, kind, that's functional. I mean, technically, in my world where it's black and white and you have requirements, I've actually implemented what the designer said. But let's be honest here, the client's going to hate that. I mean, it just, it's jerky, it sucks, it, it's you know, not remotely good. So instead, 
what we'll do is we'll put a transition on it. So we'll transition the width. We'll just start with that. So please demo God's work. So you can see now we get a nice transition. And we've done this entirely in JavaScript. There's no, sorry, in CSS. There's no JavaScript here at all. That was Freudian. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no JavaScript here. It's all CSS. And you can see here the menu animates out as well. There is one problem with that submenu though, which is that it kind of appears out of nowhere and it just, it kind of comes in behind and it looks a bit ugly. So I think we can do better. So what we'll do instead is, now you can't transition from display none to display block, which is how we're currently displaying the submenu. I'm sure theoretically you can, but in practice none of the browsers implement it. So what we'll do instead is we'll set the opacity to zero, we'll always display it as a block, we'll tell it not to respond to pointer events, and then we'll just transition the opacity on hover. Sneaky. And theoretically we now get a fade in and a fade out. Fade in, fade out. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Transition gotchas. Some properties aren't animatable across browsers, um, and much, much more insidiously, some properties behave differently depending on the specific value the property has. The case in point is WebKit can animate backgrounds from one background colour to another background colour. Unless that background colour is a gradient or in some versions of WebKit uh, an RGBA literal, in which case it can't animate from one to the other. Um, it also can't animate an image to another image, but Mozilla can. Um, <laughs> you get the idea. It, um, some properties just behave oddly depending on the specific values. So you, again, it's just a question of testing. It's not the end of the world. It's not even you know, the Mayan calendar coming to an end. It's just, you've just got to check it. CSS also gives us keyframe animation, which I'm going to have to rush through slightly because I am running slightly out of time. But keyframe animation is another declarative way of doing animation and conceptually it's similar to transitions in that you're going from state to state. But it's different to transitions in that you have much more fine grained control. I, I'm kind of of two minds whether this is actually a good idea or not, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, it's, it's starting to feel like CSS is turning into a programming language itself, which would be okay except for the fact that it's just ugly. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Okay, I'll show you a very simple example which doesn't really do state transitions, but at least shows the, the principle. So we've got a ball, which we're just drawing as a circle using border radius because I can't be bothered generating a sprite or anything, um, and we'll position it within that. So what we'd like to do is animate it around. Now normally you'd have to use JavaScript, um, that would admittedly allow you to use some sort of physics engine, um, but instead we'll just go with this. So what I've done here is to find a set of keyframes, which just, in this case it's positions, but the browsers that support CSS animations will animate anything that you can transition. So you can do the same thing with other properties as well, you know, dimensions, colours, all of those sorts of things. So all we're doing here is we're just moving it around by doing left, just absolutely positioning it, same as you would normally. And then on the actual element, all we've done is one line. Now, you, again, you have to vendor prefix the animation property if you're actually doing this for real, but to save space and avoid having to use about 10 point type on this, we'll just go with this. Again, this is a shorthand for a longer set of properties, but name of the, key, name of the animation, length of the animation, the timing function that we're using. So in this case I'm doing linear because if you actually ease it, it eases from along a curve from, from each keyframe to each other keyframe. So it actually slows down as it hits the edges and then speeds up then slows down. It looks shit. So we'll just go with that. And it's infinite. So it just keeps going forever and ever and ever and ever and we can never detect slides. it until I change slides, which I've now done. And as I said, you can also do other elements as well. So, you know, you can horrify people by <laughs> um, I obviously omitted the text colour changes just to fit it all on the slide, but otherwise that's exactly what it's actually running. That's vaguely hypnotic and slightly nauseating. Let's, let's move on. Okay, so effectively what I've done is shown some techniques where you can take what you get from your designer, which may well be static, and turn it into something pretty. What that really means, of course, is you're now a designer. You're just an animation designer. Aside from sounding really good in job interviews, um, the, other, the other use of that is it makes a huge difference to the quality of the sites you produce. 
if a little bit of effort into the animations, how people interact with it, how the site responds and flows when they're interacting with the navigation, makes a huge difference to how your client, whether it's internal or external, or just you, or just your mum, or your dog, or whoever you're, you're dealing with, perceives the site. It, it makes it feel more interactive. If you get it right, it makes it feel more interactive. Now, you've always been able to do this because you've always had you know, JavaScript and you've always had techniques like that. But where this comes in handy is you can prototype these things much more simply because the syntax is easy. It, it's, you know, it, it's an extra few CSS rules. It's, you can do it in your sleep and you can change, you can tinker with all the parameters really easily without actually having to, to dig into JavaScript. Now, for backward compatibility, of course, you've got a couple of options. My advice is to use something like modernizers to feature detection, and then you can either choose whether you're going to degrade gracefully or not. Now, modernizer basically is very simple to use, as you can see. No underpants theft required. And then you get a set of classes. This is actually the set of classes Modernizer has applied to my slide deck. And you can see it's all the features that Chrome currently supports. So there's Canvas, and there's geolocation, and multiple backgrounds, and inline SVG. Um, there's actually nothing there prefixed with no. Oh, sorry, no touch. So there you go. There's one thing it doesn't do, mostly because it's you know, a very old MacBook. And you also get a JavaScript object. So these are classes that are applied to the HTML element. So you can match these in CSS. But you also then get a JavaScript object as well with the same thing. So modernizer touch is false on this particular browser. If I had my tablet down here, it would be true. There is one problem with modernizer. It's trying to do more than one thing now. It's also got a script loader in it. There are some other weird things. So I would suggest just ignoring the bolts on the side and just going with the actual feature detection, because that's what it does best. So the reality is you can either port your new animations and transitions and all of those cool things to JavaScript, or you can just forego the enhancements and just have flat colors and just you know static transitions like that. Which one's the right answer is obviously up to you and up to your client. I can't answer that for you. I can flip a coin for you if you really like. Just hit me on Twitter, I'll tell you if it's heads or tails, but that probably isn't going to help you very much. So, as I said, I think it's really useful for prototyping. I mean, this is a cut-down version of what I showed you earlier for that navigation transition where we just transition the width. Now, I can tinker with the time, I can tinker with the widths, I can tinker with all of those things. Now, when it comes time to turn this into a live site, of course, I've got to turn it into JavaScript to make it work in older browsers. The good thing is, all of the numbers you need have come out of that. You've already figured all of this out. You've already shown it to your client. They're already thrilled. They think you're the best person ever. They've paid you an extra bonus. In, in your dreams. <laughs> but the good news is you don't have to do any extra work. It's just a straight up bit of jQuery. We all know how to write that. And it's really straightforward. You know, the widths are there, the timing's there. If you were using a custom animation curve, you could put that in there as well. It's, it's really straightforward then to go from what you've actually proven works from a holistic point of view and actually turn it into code. There are some resources. I have no time at all for questions. But um, I'm sure I can probably deal with one or two anyway while yep. the next so presenter sets up. Let's take some questions while our presenters change over. Cool. What about accessibility? Well, I mean... It um, a lot of the new cool CSS things don't work too well with accessibility and some of the methods you've used as well. I think, um, I think used appropriately, they don't... What the hell have I done there? They don't really hurt accessibility overly if you're using them carefully. And I mean, that's got to be part of your testing procedure realistically, is knowing your audience and actually designing with, with them in mind. I mean, for things like you know, navigational animations and things like that, it's no worse for accessibility than using a hover already was. It, it's, you know, it's, the same, it's the exact same technique. It's just, it's just a question of, you know, can you go too far with it? Of course you can, but you can also go too far with jQuery. You can go too far with, with any other toolkit. So it's just, I think as long as you use it appropriately, there's no negative accessibility impact necessarily. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, any others? Um, are there any compilers or processes available that will do all the browser prefixing for you and fix up the syntax for the features that have different syntax? As I said, I, I tend to use just online generators personally um, because I find that that tends to get the job done. I'm sure that some of the compilers out there like Less probably do have support for it, but it's not something I've investigated. 
Nobody else? All right, please thank Evan for his presentation.